Howdy, and welcome to Wise About Texas, the Texas History Podcast. This is your host, Ken Wise, and I want to thank you for tuning in for a little Texas history. I want to begin by saying a special thanks to everyone who has left a review on iTunes. Those reviews, the star ratings, really help move the podcast up the ratings chart and help other history lovers find out a little more about Texas. I was talking the other day at a conference to a network CEO, a podcast network CEO from Los Angeles, and he was very impressed with the number of reviews that Wise About Texas has. So if you haven't left one yet, please click on ratings and reviews on the show's iTunes page and hit your star rating. I hope that it's a five. Well, summertime in Texas, this episode's being released July 2018. Summertime means means road trips, so I hope you're taking a little Texas history with you and you'll tell your friends about it as they drive around this great state. Now, the listeners of this podcast know how much I love the Texas Hill Country, and I've discussed in a couple of episodes my roots in the mid-1800s German immigration to Texas. I'm also on the Texas Supreme Court Task Force for the Preservation of Historic Court Records. Historic court records are critically important because you can really learn a lot about the history of a community if you look at the court records. Now, when you think about court records, you probably think about crimes, and that's certainly part of it. But also, we have lots of civil court records that reveal lots of information about titles. Sometimes they adjudicate titles. It reveals a lot about immigration. It reveals a lot about the wealth of the community through the probate records. They are very, very important. Well, how in the world does the Texas Hill Country and my interest in court record preservation come together in this episode. Well, let me give you one more little data point. I was uh, planning, when I was thinking about this episode, planning a little trip to Blanco this summer, and I was also watching Lonesome Dove at the same time. And all of those things are going to come together in this episode because it reminded me of a story of very early days in Fredericksburg, Texas. It's a story of how the earliest county records of Gillespie County were lost. So let's go back to the 1840s and get wise about Texas. Now in an earlier episode, Wise About Texas, episode 26, about Jacob Broadbeck being the first man to fly an airplane, I started to discuss a little bit about the German immigration to Texas in the 1840s. And what we discussed was the formation of the Adelsverein, and no, I have not learned how to pronounce that any better since that episode, but that association for the protection of German immigrants to Texas was formed to facilitate the immigration uh, of Germans, which occurred by the thousands in the 1840s. And the plan was to obtain a land grant, which the, the society did, called the Fisher-Miller Grant, and it was up on the Llano River, and I know it's pronounced Llano, but in Texas we often pronounce it Llano, the Llano River, and uh, up around the present-day town of Llano and the surrounding areas. And the intention was to uh, pave the way from Indianola, one of the popular immigration points, and if the ship on which you immigrated landed in Galveston, you made your way to Indianola because that was the starting point. They... uh, blazed a trail from Indianola north to this Fisher Miller Grant, and they intended to, they, the German society, intended to build two way stations on the way. The first was New Braunfels, and the second is present-day Fredericksburg. So Fredericksburg was not intended to be the city it became. It was intended to be a stopping point on the way to the land grant. Well, the president of the Adelsverein, John Musebach, Stopped in Fredericksburg, he picked out a site between two creeks, Town Creek and Barron's Creek, and it became so popular that uh, they just sort of built the town there and didn't go any further. Now, as you might imagine, in the 1840s, one of the reasons that they wouldn't want to venture out in uh, the wilderness away from the settlement would be the Comanche Indians. But I also mentioned in episode 26, and I want to discuss in a little bit more detail, Musabach's efforts to make peace with the Indians. It's really one of the only Indian treaties that ever stuck in the dealings with the Comanche Indians. And uh, 
I found an early account of Musenbox dealings. Now, I, this is a secondary source, but it discusses uh, three points that Musenbox made with the Indians. First, uh, part of the deal was that the Indians and the whites could travel to each other's settlements without harm, that uh, the Comanches with whom they were making the treaty would support the German settlers when faced with thievery or aggression from either other whites or other Indians, and that the German settlers would come to the aid of the Comanches in like circumstances. And it also provided that the whites could survey the area unmolested. Now, this would have been critically important uh, because land was being granted in that area. And the Indians agreed to all this. Interestingly, the Indians called um, the surveying tools, particularly the compass, the Indians had a word for the compass meaning land stealer. So they, they didn't call the men the land stealers. They called the tool the land stealer. Um, according to the account I found, the uh, there were also some discussions, of course, about trade. And uh, there were three chiefs present, Old Owl, Santa Ana, and Buffalo Hump. And the chiefs took turns sp- speaking. Old Owl spoke first. Old Al approved the treaty and said he would come sign it in two full moons. Santa Ana then gave a longer speech because Santa Ana had actually been to Washington, D.C., and he talked about a treaty that he had made with the great father in Washington and that he hoped this new German immigrant would be like uh, the men in Washington, which was probably um, not a good hope for him to have, but he wouldn't have known at the time. He promised... uh, that this treaty would be good and everything would be okay. And then here's something very interesting. The third chief, Buffalo Hump, spoke. Now, this was in 1847. So this was after these chiefs had uh, been aware of and participated in the great Comanche raid. Well, Buffalo Hump, he said something that was very interesting. Now, this is a quote, but of course I can't verify it, but it's a very interesting quote. And Buffalo, here's what Buffalo Hump said after the other two chiefs had spoken. Quote, Do not believe that I am opposed to anything because I have not spoken. My friends have spoken. My chiefs and my warriors have consulted. My people have listened. I agree with all that Old Owl and Santa Anna have said. So now I have spoken. Close quote. The reason that's so interesting is that the Comanches were a series of independent bands. And one of the huge mistakes that were made that was made with the Comanches was assuming that if you made a treaty with one chief or two chiefs or three or twelve, as they attempted to do at the council house, you were, you were making a treaty with the entire nation. There was no such thing. And I don't, it's my position, we never quite figured that out until the war, Indian Wars had progressed so long that it was too late. But if we had listened to Buffalo Hump, if he indeed said it that way, and we had been thinking in those terms, which of course the Germans at the time were not because they were making peace, we might have realized a little earlier the politics of the Comanche nation and perhaps avoided some bloodshed. Anyway, that treaty was entered into and it stuck for a good while. That same year, 1847, the first privately owned store opened in Fredericksburg. The Adelsverein had run a store and supply depot, but a privately owned store was opened. It was owned by a man named Ron Slaben. He sold it shortly to a man named Chester Starks, and Starks enjoyed good business from the U.S. War Department, which I'll talk about in a minute. And another man opened a store around this time. His name was John M. Hunter, and he is the subject of our story. Now, these storekeepers would have prospered not only because of Fort Martin Scott and the U.S. soldiers, but also because of trade with the Indians under that treaty, which was consistent and effective for both sides. Now, at this time, Fredericksburg was part of Bear County, but the citizens, uh, the population had grown to a couple thousand by 1847, and the citizens wanted to split off and form their own local government, which in Texas means forming a new county. So several citizens signed a petition to the legislature to create a new county. John M. Hunter, our storekeeper, was one of those individuals. And in February of 1848, the legislature created a new county, naming it 
for Captain Robert Gillespie, who was killed in the Battle of Monterey the year, uh, two years before in the Mexican War. The county heard, had their first elections, and our friend John M. Hunter was elected as the county clerk. Well, let's talk about John Hunter. I mentioned that he opened a store in 1847, one of the early storekeepers in Fredericksburg. And one of the reasons the storekeepers were so prosperous was because in 1849, with the California gold rush, the commerce in Fredericksburg really picked up. And why would that be? Well, Fredericksburg at that time was the last town on the road to El Paso. And if you were going to California, you were going through El Paso, which means you were going to stop at the last town between Central Texas and El Paso, that being Fredericksburg. And if you think about the distance from Fredericksburg, Texas to El Paso, Texas, through the wilderness, across the Great Comanche War Trail, and the desert, you darn sure were going to stop at that last town. So the storekeepers prospered. Well, John Hunter was also the county clerk, so he kept all the county records in the back of his store because there was no courthouse. Hunter, incidentally, was from Tennessee. I failed to mention that. He came to Texas from Tennessee. He married a lady named Sophie Ahrens, and Miss Ahrens had arrived in November 1845 in Galveston on the ship Hercules. I wasn't able to find the exact date of their marriage, but sometime between 45 and 47 is my guess. Now, one more thing about John Hunter. He was described in various accounts as outspoken, independent-minded, and my favorite, the very 1800s understated word, enthusiastic. Um, So I think Mr. Hunter was probably a fairly severe an intense personality, and not afraid to tell you what he thought. All right, so what else was going on in Fredericksburg at this time? I mentioned a minute ago Fort Martin Scott, so let me tell you about that. In 1848, a couple of companies of U.S. soldiers arrived on Barron's Creek, two miles south of Fredericksburg, and they set up what came to be known as that camp near Fredericksburg. It was also called Camp Houston. Eventually, they built an outpost and named it for a major Martin Scott, who was also killed in the Mexican War, just like Robert Gillespie. One of the men who spent some time at Fort Martin Scott was Robert E. Lee, who at the time was a U.S. Army officer. In fact, he and Hunter were very well acquainted. One account uh, I read said that uh, Robert E. Lee gave Hunter a rifle that Hunter had admired uh, that was later given to a gunsmith in Fredericksburg named Krauskopf. Um, I think it was actually a gun that Krauskopf made for Robert E. Lee. And I can't resist doing that very wise about Texas thing and telling you for a minute, let me digress into the gun maker, Engelbert Krauskopf, because this was interesting. He was a professional hunter, and he worked for John Musabach. So as they went north and were trying to establish Fredericksburg, of course, you needed uh, people to hunt and feed the group. So that was Krauskopf's job. He had been a cabinet maker in Germany. And he, after the treaty, became friends with that Comanche chief, Santa Ana. And they uh, traded very often. Uh, Krauskopf, in his life, owned a sawmill, he owned a cotton gin, but gun making and ammunition manufacturing during the Civil War was his bread and butter. He also did some work for Winchester and actually improved some of their rifles. And I'm going to talk more about that in some bonus content I'm going to post on the Patreon site, which I'll tell you about when we wrap up. But nevertheless, Krauskopf was a very renowned gun maker and friend of both Hunter and Robert E. Lee. Well, the Indian Treaty really made the soldiers' presence not all that necessary in the early days of Fort Martin Scott. But after the gold rush started and the commerce started coming through Fredericksburg Fredericksburg more often, uh, the, the people as they traveled west would have surprised some of the uh, Indian bands that had made the treaty, and they probably would have run across several Indian bands that were no part of that treaty. And so there was some tension with the Indians, and the soldiers got a little bit busier, uh, but eventually, and no doubt due to the influence of the Germans that had been there longer, uh, some soldiers went out and renewed the treaty with the Indians and calmed the tensions down. So the soldiers really didn't have all that much to do. And that eventually led to boredom, which eventually led to mischief. 
Now, these stores in Fredericksburg were not only stores. They also sold whiskey. So the storekeepers would have been sort of bartenders, which accounts for the title of this episode. And eventually, the soldiers buying whiskey in the stores came across our enthusiastic and outspoken outspoken county clerk and storekeeper, John Hunter. One story goes that Hunter got mad one day at a soldier, threw him out of the store, but before he threw him out, he knocked him in the head with an axe handle. The soldier was so angry, he came for Hunter later that night to kill him. He mistook an innocent Fredericksburg citizen for Hunter, shot and killed the citizen, was arrested, and later lynched by a Fredericksburg mob. Now, I have grown up going to Fredericksburg since the earliest days of my life. I have a very difficult time imagining a lynch mob of a bunch of Germans from Fredericksburg, but that's what the account said. Um, I did as much research as I could and could not find a story of that lynching, but if you find it, please contact me and let me know. I've got some early German books coming, and if I have any updates, I'll uh, throw them out in a bonus episode or social media. But in any event, uh, Hunter was no doubt fairly strict when it came to soldiers' behavior in his store. Well, one day, a soldier named Dole had had a little too much to drink, but not enough to satisfy him, so he stumbled in to Hunter's store and asked for more whiskey. Hunter, for whatever reason, would not sell any more to the soldier. Dole apparently insulted Hunter, so Hunter did what any good Texan would do in the middle 1800s. He pulled out his knife, and he stabbed Dole to death. Well, Hunter must have realized the gravity of his impulsive action, and he left town. And it's a good thing, because the following night, the soldiers from the fort gathered together and stormed the store, looking for Hunter. They didn't find him, so they did the next best thing they could think of. They surrounded the store, posted guards, and lit it on fire. The citizens of Fredericksburg swarmed the store trying to get in, but the soldiers wouldn't let them. I'm sure in the soldiers' minds, the citizens were trying to rescue the goods from the store, and the soldiers decided that the store and everything Hunter owned was going to be burned, so they kept the citizens at bay. But from the citizen standpoint, they weren't going for the goods in the store. They wanted those county records, the earliest history of Fredericksburg, Texas, and the settling of the Germans in the area was going up in flames, all at the hands of U.S. soldiers and a surly bartender. Well, some accounts of this incident say that nothing happened to either Hunter or the soldiers. An an account from the 1930s citing a German text from the 1800s says that Hunter was tried and acquitted in San Antonio. But I have to guess that the soldiers weren't tried for anything because in the words of the character Augustus McRae in Lonesome Dove, quote, it ain't much of a crime whacking a surly bartender, close quote. Well, it ain't much of a crime to burn his store down either, at least in 1850. Well, now we come to the part of the show I call Getting There, where I tell you where to go see some of the locations I've mentioned in the episode. There is never a bad time to travel to Fredericksburg, Texas, one of the prettiest areas of the state. So get on up to Fredericksburg, and you'll find the location of John Hunter's store at 120 East Main between North Adams Street and North Lano Street, Lano's Highway 16 in Fredericksburg. Um, The Bank of Fredericksburg was built on the site in 1898. Now, the store was located sort of in the middle of the block, but after the soldiers burned it and after the tempers cooled off, Hunter returned and rebuilt his store almost immediately on the southeast corner of that same block. So that would have been uh, the block located, or the corner located on Main and Lano Street in Fredericksburg. The store was rebuilt so fast, it was used as the district court in September 1850. So even though all the county records had been lost, apparently uh, they trusted Hunter to hold court in his store. By the way, this whole incident occurred on June 30th and July 1st of 1850. So they rebuilt that store pretty quick. The remains of Fort Martin Scott still stand 
It's on Highway 290 south of Fredericksburg between the Texas Ranger Heritage Center and the water plant. Admission to Fort Martin Scott is free. They have a lot of heritage events at the site. You you can go to their website at ftmartinscott.org. I mentioned it's next door to the Texas Ranger Heritage Center. That's operated by the former Texas Ranger Foundation. And you can go to their website at trhc.org. And and there are several events that are held throughout the year at the Texas Ranger Heritage Center. John Hunter died in Fredericksburg. He's buried in the city cemetery. That's on North Lee Street in Fredericksburg. Well, that wraps it up for this episode of Wise About Texas. I hope you'll go to the Wise About Texas Facebook page and push the like button. We're on Twitter and Instagram at Wise About Texas. And don't forget to go to iTunes and leave a review if you get a minute. I mentioned bonus content I'm going to post on Patreon. If you go to p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com, you have the opportunity to support the promotion and preservation of Texas history. Well, thanks a lot for listening to this episode of Wise About Texas. Be safe in your summer travels. Go out and do something for Texas today. And until next time, God bless Texas, and we'll see you down the road.